All right. So today I'm going to be talking about how animals become skeletons in a museum collection. Um, just a quick disclaimer, uh, the, this presentation discusses the process of dissecting animals and it includes pictures of that process. Some of the photos include uh, blood, internal organs, skin, and bones, so just be aware. Um, some of the photos can be graphic, but they should be viewed in the context of being an opportunity to see science in action. I am currently the digital archivist at the History Center, uh, but before that I worked at the California Academy of Sciences as a curatorial assistant, and in that role I worked to preserve and prepare specimens for the museum collection. Um, I worked on a little over 2,000 specimens ranging in size from whales all the way down to mice and hummingbirds, and I also published a a uh, journal article about the process, about the process of skeletonizing animals. And um, I'll point out what that was specifically on later. Uh, and almost all of the photos included in this presentation were taken by me. Um, so not this one, not the one on the first slide, which is of a manatee skull. So the History Center only has a few skulls in its collection since it's not a natural history museum and the skulls and bones that we do have are primarily related to archaeological sites rather than natural history. If you are interested in visiting a natural history museum in Florida, the Florida Museum of Natural History in Gainesville would probably be your best option. Um, up until January, there was a small skulls museum on International Drive, but that is now permanently closed. Uh, the History Center does have some bones and bone tools on display on the fourth floor. We also have some taxidermy, like the polar bears on the first floor, Billy the Swan, and this little alligator in the photo. Um, these other skulls are all part of our collection as well. Uh, this first one is a cow skull. Uh, this is a bear, and this is a cat skull. So you might be wondering why museums keep bones at all and what value they have. One of the most important reasons is to preserve the species record. I'm sure everyone has seen stories in the news about discoveries of new species. So that process is a lot more complicated than just saying, you know, I've never seen this animal before, so it must be a new species, name it after me. Um, you have to actually prove that it is a new species. And to do that, you have to compare it to existing species. To make that comparison, you need examples of those species, including their skeletons. If you do in fact discover new species, that first specimen is then called a type specimen, and it's kept as proof of the existence of that species, and it allows later researchers to study the specimen. It's also used as a comparison with other previously identified species to ensure the same species is not identified as two different species. Type specimens are incredibly valuable and are usually kept under the highest levels of, of security in a museum. And this is a hippo skull. For species with few specimens, the goal is to save as much as possible, which often means preserving the skin and a partial skeleton. The skin of an animal, particularly in birds, provides a great deal of information for scientists. The only downside of saving the skin is that some bones from the skeleton will remain in the skin. For birds, that typically, typically includes the uh, legs, uh, wing bones, and the skull. And for mammals, it typically includes the bones and the paws and the claws. Museums also keep bones because there is an ever-increasing ability to do lab testing on specimens that did not exist 10 or 20 years ago. As science continues to advance, so does what can be learned from skeletons. Some of that research can be done while the specimen is fresh, but it will only stay fresh for a short time and must be preserved in some way to survive in the long term and be available to later researchers. Um, and on this slide, there are a number of weasels that were turned into study skins, um, birds that were also turned into study skins, and, a wild, and some wild chickens. Uh, that were turned into study skins. So besides the type specimen, museums often keep many different examples of the same species. 
In some cases, a museum might have thousands of specimens from all uh, the same species. On this slide, there's a picture of a Socorro dove, a green sea turtle skull, and a snow leopard skull. The Socorro dove is currently extinct in the wild, and there are less than 200 purebred birds in captivity. As a result, this specimen is very valuable because a scientist can't go out and observe the species or find more in the wild. They're limited to the specimens left in museums. Um, these specimens show scientists how the Socorro dove continues to change while living in captivity and breeding with other species. Scientists can study species like this that have gone extinct to find out how to prevent that from happening in other species. The green sea turtle, which can be found in Florida, is currently listed as being endangered, and the snow leopard is listed as vulnerable. Preserving these specimens helps scientists study these species not only now, but going back potentially hundreds of years. Natural history museums collect specimens throughout their existence, which creates a timeline of a spe spe species stretching back to the opening of the museum or even earlier. That long record of specimens allows scientists to study things like how the distribution of a species has changed over time, how their diet has changed, how their size has changed, um, and many other things. As a quick example, scientists recently found that during the Industrial Revolution, many birds that were white changed to more of a gray color as a result of all the increased pollution. This study was only possible because museums had specimens from before, during, and after the Industrial Revolution. And they also had enough specimens from all over the world to uh, provide re reliable sample size. Historically speaking, bones provide a link from the fossil record to living animals, and they serve as reference material for people like archaeologists. When an archaeologist finds a bone at a dig site, they often visit natural history museums to determine what animal the bone came from. Natural history museums are like a library of animals that provide researchers with a large research pool to draw from, which increases the value of any studies done and makes them more representative of the species as a whole. And uh, the last photo on this slide in the middle is of one of the weasels from the previous slide. And if you look uh, right here, you can see that it was um, found and prepared in 1894, um, and it's survived uh, pretty much perfectly since then. The public also tends to find bones interesting, and they are often used in museum displays. This is an example from the California Academy of Sciences of around 900 California sea lion skulls. These skulls only represent a small portion of the Academy's total California sea lion collection, and the display also includes a few skulls from other animals mixed in uh, to kind of form a little game for visitors. Bones can also help educate veterinarians and archaeologists on the internal structure of an animal without needing to go out and dissect a fresh specimen. Artists also like to use bones as a close-up reference for their work, which allows for greater detail and accuracy. The History Center doesn't have very many photos of specimens, but the, photo, the two photos on this slide are part of our collection. Um, unfortunately, we don't have a lot of context to go along with these photos, but they are part of our collection. For species that are widely represented in in museum collections, museums will often only start saving the skulls of animals. Most of the sea lion skulls on the earlier slide are the only part of the skeletons that were kept besides the baculum. Um, and for context, the California Academy of Sciences has probably about 20,000 California sea lions in their collection, um, so space is very important. Their collection also includes about 100,000 birds, and uh, quite a few mammals as well. This is done to save space in the collection and to reduce ti the time required to process specimens. Think about saving entire whales, elephants, or giraffes. A single specimen can take up a ton of space and require lots of time and effort to clean. 
is also done because in the skeleton, the skull is the single most valuable bone for scientists and researchers because it holds the most information about the animal. The rest of the skeleton does provide a lot of information, but, not, but no single bone provides more than the skull. The skeleton can tell things like age, diet, if it was bipedal or quadrupedal, and size, just to name a few. But often it requires multiple bones or all the bones to learn these things, whereas the skull can often provide all or most of that information by itself. Uh, the photos on the slide include a Cook's petrel um, up here, a, an aardvark, and a full California sea lion uh, skeleton from a female California sea lion. When comparing bones from different animals, most are going to look similar, but the skull can be significantly different. The skull is the best way to distinguish what animal you might be dealing with. On this slide, there are quite a few different skulls shown. Every single one of these skulls is from a domesticated dog. Within this one species, you can see how diverse the skulls are. Dogs are a great example because of how much humans have done to change their characteristics from their common ancestor, the wolf. Uh, take a look at the noses and nasal passages of these dogs. As you can see, there are significant differences. Take something like an English bulldog and a greyhound. Uh, the greyhound has a much longer, narrower pa uh, nasal passage that can take up you know, most of its skull or at least half of its skull. Whereas for something like an English bulldog, the nose is almost non-existent. Um, this can also be seen on animals that have trouble breathing um, because of how they've been bred. Uh, the skull can also provide clues to whether the animal is a predator or prey species. Um, predators tend to have larger eye sockets with better vision and possibly nocturnal vision. And the eyes tend to be front facing with a narrower field of view, uh, but they have greater detail and better depth perception to find and lock onto prey. In prey animals, their eyes are often on the sides of the skull to look out for predators, avoid sneak attacks, and provide a greater field of view. Um, and the skull on the left is from a Shih Tzu. So just like the dogs and other mammals, birds have developed a wide range of different skull shapes and types as well, based on food choice, environment, and even weather. The best example of this is the Galapagos finches, which were first collected by Charles Darwin and helped lead to the theory of evolution. The Galapagos finches evolved into a wide variety of different subspecies to take advantage of the different food sources. Um, and on this slide, you can see some of the vast diversity in skull shapes and sizes. Uh, and so starting from the top left going down, there's a marabou stork, brown pelican, uh, black crowned night heron, black footed albatross, Clark's grebe, flamingo, barn owl, barred owl, turkey vulture, grasshopper sparrow, Allen's hummingbird, black spotted barbet, blue tailed bee eater, Cassin's auklet, chestnut backed chickadee, common muir, eclectus parrot, uh, horned puffin, Magellanic penguin, and a yellow warbler skull. Um, and you can just see how different all of these skulls are. So the teeth from different animals can also be very informative about what the animals eat, its age, and its health. Um, for predators, they usually have canines that are sharp for catching prey, eating meat, and puncturing flesh, and premolars that are shaped to mesh together like scissors to cut through muscle and bone. In prey, their teeth are typically flat to grind up leaves, and omnivores have both types of teeth. Um, so on this slide, there's some um, uh, baleen from a gray whale, uh, snow leopard uh, canine and incisor, um, a rodent's teeth, which is this one up here. And if you look, you can see that the tooth grows into the skull, and that will continue to grow throughout the rodent's life and uh, keep pushing out. Um, there's also a 
killer whale or orca here. Great. Uh, and an aardvark. And this is a rabbit skull. Um, so you can see some of the variety in teeth. So specimens arrive at museums in a few different ways. In the past, the majority of specimens were hunted and killed by scientists to add to museum collections. But that practice ended quite a while ago when scientists realized how much harm it was causing to uh, existing species, uh, in some cases leading to the extinction of those species. Now the majority of specimens come from donations of naturally deceased specimens. Natural history museums work with the public, animal hospitals, fish and wildlife, zoos, and other organizations that deal with animals to obtain specimens. The specimens donated by these organizations typically died of natural causes. Scientists do still collect specimens themselves, but the practice is highly regulated and is often done in conjunction with animal welfare programs. For example, the barred owl, which is native to the East Coast in Florida, has been expanding across the United States and has reached all the way to the West Coast, where it's considered an invasive species. The problem with the barred owl on the West Coast is that it's taking over from the native spotted owls and is causing the spotted owl population to significantly decline. Because of this, there has been an ongoing study on the West Coast that has involved shooting barred owls to preserve the population of spotted owls uh, in a very controlled way um, and only uh, nat national park rangers are allowed to uh, shoot the owls. Um, this program has led to an increase in specimens being preserved in museums and a great deal of scientific knowledge being produced about the species and how to better manage it. Um, and on this slide, there's a photo of a California sea lion skull and a barred owl, and that's a barred owl skull. So if specimens are donated by an individual, they typically come in one at a time or in a small batch and can range from freshly found dead to frozen. If, a, if specimens come in from animal hospitals or other organizations, typically they will be delivered in larger batches that have been frozen. It's really hard to predict the volume of new specimens since the animals are dying of natural causes and you never know how many you'll get in a year or in a day or in a month. Um, once specimens arrive, data is collected from the donor about where the specimen was found, when, possible cause of death, possible species, and current condition. The specimen is then frozen to ensure that there are no pests living on the specimen, such as maggots. The specimen will remain frozen until staff have time to process them, which could take years depending on the specimen and the amount of staff time available. Um, so on this slide, there is a, a, a gull, a common muir, and a double-crested cormorant. There's also a western gray squirrel, and that gray squir squirrel is going to pop up a few more times in the presentation uh, in various stages of preparation. So when staff have time to work on the specimen, it's removed from the freezer and allowed to thaw out. A great deal of value uh, from these specimens has to do with the data associated with them so it must all be carefully recorded. The amount of data collected can vary from institution to institution, but at the most basic level, location, date, and species must be collected. It's also important to record measurements, the weight of the specimen, and any distinguishing features, such as cause of death or past injuries. Typically, it's best to collect uh, weight, total length, tail length, wing length, tarsus, beak, length and depth for birds, and weight, total length, tail length, and foot for mammals. Um, and if you look closely on these documents, number three is the some of the documentation for that western gray squirrel from the previous slide. Uh, data collection continues throughout the process, depending on the specific animal. Sometimes more information is found when the animal has been opened up, and in some it's not apparent till the bones have been cleaned. Uh, this first photo is of a seabird that was found with a large fishing hook and line going all the way from outside of the mouth into the body cavity. Um, and you can still see the hook in the body. 
the other picture is of a bullet that was found while cleaning a California sea lion skull. Uh, the bullet was found after the skull had been completely cleaned and it was drying. Um, it's unclear where the where it came from exactly. Uh, there was no damage to the bone, and it was not it was not uh, considered to be the cause of death for that animal. Um, in fact, larger animals can often be found with non-fatal bullets lodged in their bodies. One of my colleagues worked on a stellar sea lion. Uh, that had three bullets from three different caliber guns all located around the skull that were not the cause of death. death. Um, and to be clear, shooting uh, California sea lions and stellar sea lions and most animals is against the law. Um, and all of these cases were reported to fish and wildlife. Um, the last photo on this slide is of a Townsend's warbler skull. If you look, you can see the skull has a uh, has been dented in, and that was the cause of a window collision, which is a fairly common um, cause of death in smaller birds. So this is an x-ray of a California sea lion that was shot with a shotgun and a rifle. The shotgun injury probably happened earlier and did not kill the animal. Uh, the rifle did, um, and you can see the, the rifle the bullet lodged in the skull. But not all injuries come from humans. This California sea lion had a sea urchin spine that had punctured its face and lodged itself into the bone of the mandible. Um, the injury introduced bacteria, which caused the bone to grow around the spine. So if you look at the bottom photo, um, that's what a healthy, normal uh, California sea lion mandible should look like. You can see in the top photo and the right photo, that the bone has grown um, kind of into a, an opening, and that opening would have been where the surgeon's spine was. Uh, if you look at the bone, you can also see that it's porous and not very well um, constructed, and that, that was also caused by the bacteria. Um, and this, this animal would have lived with that spine for quite a while before it, it eventually did die. So damage to the bone can also be caused by things like fishing line. In some cases, the fishing line can cut through the bone and into the skull of the animal. Um, so this, the, the top skull, uh, you can see the fishing line is still there and the bone has actually started to grow back over the, where, the, where it cut through the bone. Um, fortunately, injuries to this degree are a lot less common. These were both, uh, found in, I think, the 1980s. Um, but these injuries have reduced significantly thanks to efforts by um, animal hospitals and marine mammal centers that have worked to get to animals before significant damage can be caused. Um, for older animals, especially domestic animals or zoo animals, arthritis can also be seen on the bones. Uh, once as much data as possible has been collected, it's time to start skinning. When the specimen and the skeleton are being preserved, the goal is to have the smallest cut possible on the specimen. If the skin is not being saved, there is less concern with the size of the cut, and it's much easier to work with a larger cut. For birds and mammals, the initial cut is made along the chest of the animal and expanded from there. So this first photo is of a long-tailed weasel um, and that was turned into a study skin. So for this, it, for this photo in particular, the body has already been removed and replaced with cotton, but the entire uh, skeleton and, and internal structure was removed through that, that small hole. Next to it is a common squirrel monkey. Um, that specimen was necropsied by the zoo before it was sent to the academy, um, and they took most of the internal organs out. Um, and because of how they cut the skin, it was not able to be saved, but the entire skeleton was saved. Uh, the other photos, the other animals in these photos are a gray whale, gray fox, um, margay, and a southern poodoo. So the skin is removed from the specimen, um, and there's a gray whale 
the that same southern kudu and the western gray squirrel that showed up in earlier slides. So once the skin has been removed, samples are collected from the specimen. The samples that are taken can vary depending on the species and the condition of the animal. Often specimens are not in great shape and their internal organs are not in the condition worth saving. Typically, muscle tissue and liver samples should be collected to allow for future research at the most basic level. Uh, samples can also include any of the other organs, stomach context, contents, swaths of all the orifices, and vibrissa. Samples can also include things like ticks or mites that are on the skin of the animal. Um, and so the first photo is of a close-up of a gray whale, and those are um, mites on its skin. Um, and then the third photo is of a barred owl. Um, and because those were part of a specific study, um, it required taking samples from pretty much every part of the animal, including analyzing their stomach contents to determine what exactly they were eating and how best to manage that. Uh, once the samples have been collected, it's best to remove any remaining internal organs and as much meat as possible from the skeleton. Uh, this will speed up the process. This will speed up any future processing. Um, and so there's a rhesus macaque with the pile of meat that's been removed from its legs, arms, and uh, chest. A sea otter skull with the brain still um, in the skull which was a rare find, and a sea turtle. The next step is transforming the specimen from a skinned animal to a pile of bones. There are a few different methods that are regularly employed to do this. Those methods include using domestic beetles or similar animals, maceration in water, burial, and above ground macera maceration. All of these methods are regularly employed and have different advantages and disadvantages. Um, Dermestid beetles, which is what I wrote my paper on, uh, are a family of beetles that include species native to almost everywhere on the planet, and they can often be found on carcasses in the wild about a week after an animal has died. The beetles only eat dead flesh and primarily leave the bones alone. However, they can eat through bones and might if they are low on food, the bones are extremely greasy, the bones are very small, or the colony is incredibly active all of which can be managed by the person taking care of them. Uh, Dermestids do not eat living flesh and are a very quick and efficient method to cleaning a skeleton. One of the reasons for removing the organs is that oftentimes the dermestids will not eat the organs quickly and the organs will harden and stain the bones. One side effect to using dermestids is that their frass, which includes their poop, skin, hair, and uh, dead animals, can cause allergies for the people who work closely with the beetles. In addition to dermestids, other animals can be used, including some types of cockroaches and maggots. The disadvantages to using those other species is that they're slower, and in the case of maggots, when they become adult flies, they can fly, which increases the chance that they escape their enclosure. Dermestids can also fly if temperatures rise above 80 degrees Fahrenheit, but it's usually pretty easy to control that. If you're interested in seeing dermestids in action, there are some great videos on YouTube that show dermestids uh, at work cleaning bones, um, and they're quite interesting. Um, and so these are some of the dermestid colonies at the Academy of Sciences. And in the first photo, uh, there's a few skulls from um, dolphins. And in the second photo, those are uh, monkeys. Um, one complete skeleton and one partial skeleton. Maceration is the process of letting the bacteria that already exists on a specimen grow and essentially digest all of the remaining flesh. There are a few different maceration methods that museums employ to clean skeletons. The most efficient and safe method is warm water maceration. Skeletons can be boiled and end up with a clean skeleton in a few hours, but boiling also causes significant damage to the skeleton and is not typically used by museums. 
Warm water maceration can take anywhere from a few days to a few months, depending on the specimen being cleaned. In my experience, warm water maceration works really well for marine mammals because of the bacteria involved. And I also used it in combination with dermestids, depending on the species involved. Um, macer warm water macer maceration is also really helpful in processing specimens that have mummified or specimens that died from poison that could also kill the dermestids. It's also really good for um, animals that washed up on the beach that are in really bad condition and full of sand. Um, cold water maceration is essentially the exact same as warm water maceration. It just takes longer. So on this slide, there's a photo of a sea otter skull in a bucket that's ready to get filled up with water and start macerating. And next to it, uh, there are maceration buckets full of animals that are going through the process. Um, so burial and above ground maceration are typically used for very large animals that will not fit into maceration tanks or, be or a beetle colony. These methods were typically reserved for cleaning whale bones. Um, the burial method is taking a skeleton and burying it to allow wild animals a chance to clean the skeleton. This method can take years to complete, and there's a strong possibility that small bones will be lost. Above ground maceration is similar, but the skeleton is left on the ground, ideally in a cage, uh, which is faster than below ground maceration, but increases the chances of animals or people dragging bones away. This method is seldom used unless there's a way to strictly control access to the site. Um, so in these first two photos are of the same gray whale. Uh, and this is on a beach that can only be accessed by the water in a national park. Um, so it was just left there to decompose naturally. Uh, so in the first photo, you can see the uh, most of the vertebrae are still covered in at least a layer of meat. And you can see the different coloration in the skin. In the second photo, which was taken uh, probably two weeks later, um, the bones have been, uh, the vertebrae have been mostly clean. There's still some flesh on there, but uh, most of it's gone. Um, and the skin has changed into a, a more leathery yellow uh, color and texture. The third photo is of a California sea lion that washed up on the beach. Um, and that again was just how it naturally decomposed. Uh, you can see the front of the skull has been exposed um, and that's just natural decomposition. So after the, all the flesh has been removed, whitening is used to clean up the bones and reduce the amount of grease. When using dermestids, whitening also eliminates any frass remaining on the skeletons. There are a few different chemicals that can be used to whiten bones, including peroxides, bleach, and sodium perborate. Bleach should never be used because it will start breaking down the structure of the bones and will greatly reduce how long the bones will survive. Eventually, the bones will just turn to dust. Peroxide is, uh, hydrogen, hydrogen peroxide is often used by private collectors and is supposed to work well, but I don't have any experience using it. Uh, I typically use sodium perborate and let the skeleton soak in a mixture of it and water for about a week. For small skeletons, um, that's usually all they needed, but bigger specimens or greasy specimens would then go on to the degreasing stage. So this is a photo of a hub's beaked whale skull. Um, it was heavily damaged. Um, it went through the bugs and uh, at the time of this photo, it had just come out of the bugs. You can see it's not very um, pleasant to look at. It's covered in Grass and uh, grease, and it's it's kind of gross. Um, so that's before it gets whitened. So after a specimen has gone through a round of whitening, they move on to the degreasing stage. Degreasing is used to remove as much grease as possible from the bones. Some animals accumulate a lot of grease, especially animals that don't move around as much as they should, like domesticated animals or zoo animals. Marine mammals also tend to be very greasy. Their grease can be visible on the surface of the bones as a yellowish residue, and it can also be sticky or greasy to the touch. 
Over time, grease will work its way to the surface of bones, so older specimens that have been cleaned will often need to be re-degreased. The process typically uses ammonia diluted in water, but there are also some gases that can be used. The gases tend to be more dangerous and more expensive, but much quicker. Using ammonia can be a slow process, depending on the level of grease, and in some cases, it can take a skeleton a few days, in others, it can take year, a year or more to clean. So, uh, so the photos on this slide are all from a gorilla. Um, if you look at the hand or the paw, um, you can see the shiny parts, that's, that's the, well, the, the entire paw is covered in grease, the shiny parts are extra greasy. Um, and if you were to touch this or hold it in your hand, it would be sticky and kind of slimy to the touch. Um, on the left, there's a photo of some of the long bones and a scapula, and you can see um, kind of how dark the grease is on those bones. Um, and for those in particular, the grease will continue to come up through from the inside of the bone to the surface as, the, as time passes. Uh, here's a few more examples. Um, the goal, when whitening and degreasing, the goal isn't to make all the specimens uh, white. The goal is to remove the grease and ensure the specimens are clean enough not to attract pests. So in this top photo, uh, it's a desert, desert kangaroo rat skull. Um, as you can see, it's not perfectly white, but it's, it's also not greasy and it's clean. And so that would be considered um, a completed uh, it would be considered to have completed the process. Um, underneath that is a Pembroke Corgi skull, um, which looks, uh, you know, much cleaner than the other one, but it actually has a film of uh, grease on top of it and need, needs to be um, cleaned up a little bit more. Next to that, there's a few different skulls, um, including a bottlenose, bottlenose dolphin, a harbor porpoise, an elephant seal, and there's some California sea lions um, and other seals in the background. Once the skeleton is degreased, it's left out to dry. This helps reduce the chance of mold, um, helps prevent any cracking or damage when the bones are frozen, and it allows you to see if there's any grease remaining on the skeleton. When the bones dry, it's, it also provides an opportunity to examine the bones more closely and discover anything strange. The bird in the second photo was tangled in fishing gear when it died, including a piece of copper. Uh, the fishing line stayed with the skeleton throughout the process, and the addition of these pieces ended up turning the bones into that very unusual bluish color. Um, and then we believe that the bluish color came from its uh, exposure to the copper. Um, in the other photo, the bones have turned green, but we have no idea why that happened. Um, it could be a, a chemical the animal was exposed to before it died. Um, in addition to bones that are colored for unknown reasons, there is a naturally occurring way bones can change color called echinochrome. It occurs in sea otters that primarily eat sea urchins, and it can cause their bones and teeth to turn purple. The effects can range from no coloration at all to the entire skeleton that's purple. Most commonly, it's limited to the teeth, and I've only seen two or three animals with the entire skeleton being purple, and it can be a really, really dark purple. Um, if you look at these skulls in the bottom of the photo, uh, you can see kind of the gradation of, of how, they, how they go from um, white to purple. Um, and these are all sea lion skulls and skeletons. Uh, Freezing the animal and the bones can happen between every step in the process as both a way to safely store the specimen until it can move on to the next step and a way to ensure absolutely no living, nothing living is on the bones that could make its way into the collection and wreak havoc on other specimens. Uh, for example, if a, if a domestic beetle was able to survive and get into the collection, it could decimate the study skin specimens. Um, if it were to get into say, um, an insect collection or a butterfly collection, it could essentially eat everything and uh, destroy the entire collection. So freezing is a very important step in the process. 
Once the specimens have been fully cleaned, dried, and frozen, they can be cataloged and numbered. Cataloging involves collecting all of the data associated with the animal and putting in one place, often online, to increase visitor accessibility. Once the specimen is cataloged, all the bones in the skeleton need to be numbered with that catalog number. This is done to ensure that if the skeletons of multiple animals um, get mixed up, uh, they can be separated out again using that catalog number. Um, and in California, there's the added benefit of, um, or the added precaution in case there was an earthquake and all the um, animals ended up mixed up on the floor, which was a, a nightmare to put back together. Um, but on this slide, uh, the first photo is just as a reference to how small the bones can get. That's a pen cap next to uh, three bones from a specimen. Um, there's also a, a lion skull, a Sumatran tiger skull, and a complete fox skeleton well, that, that, that will need to be numbered. For the vast majority of specimens, the next and last step is placing them into a box in the collection to wait for a researcher who wants to see them. Some specimens will be rearticulated instead and incorporated into an exhibit, uh, but that's a very small percentage. Um, so the specimen in the box is a common walleroo. Um, the articulated bird is a cerulean kingfisher, and that was actually seized by fish and wildlife. Um, and below that are uh, marine mammals that were on display at the California Academy of Sciences. Um, so thank you for attending this virtual event. This and other historic history center programs are made possible in part by the nonprofit Historical Society of Central Florida, which supports our museum in important ways as we preserve and share Central Florida's history. Your membership and contributions are vitally important in fulfilling the History Center's mission to serve as a gateway for community engagement, education, and inspiration. It's a role we think is needed now more than ever especially during this pandemic. And to easily make a donation to the United Arts for Central Florida, you can text history UA to 91999 um, to make a donation. And we thank you for any donations. Um, I also wanted to mention that we are currently working to collect material from the uh, COVID-19 pandemic and um, the Black Lives Matter protests that are occurring in Central Florida. If you would be interested in donating anything uh, related to either of those events, you can uh, go to our COVID-19 collections page on the History Center website and let us know, or you can send me an email as well. Um, uh, if you have any questions, you can go ahead and type them into the Q&A or the chat. And I also have one more slide of photos for some of the more unusual animals that I came across, um, but those are a bit more graphic, so I'll wait till the questions are answered so anyone who's not interested has a chance to leave. Um, okay, so first question. Uh, the question is, in school we were all we were exposed to formaldehyde and its strong smell. What kind of smells are there during these processes where bacteria and beetles are used? Um, so formaldehyde is still occasionally used to uh, work with uh, pickling specimens, which I didn't really go over here, but it's another preservation method. Um, that's mostly been uh, replaced by uh, ethyl alcohol because formaldehyde can cause, is cancer causing. Um, but that, that is still present in, in uh, museums. Um, as to this process, uh, for me personally, uh, the smells, uh, you get used to them very quickly and so they tend to not really smell like much at all. Um, but other people notice that uh, obviously when the animal's uh, recently dead, you can, well, when it starts to decompose, you can smell that um, and it's not, super pleasant. Um, for maceration, it's a maceration and using the beetles are both uh, very 
smelly processes. Um, when working with beetles, the smell tends to, well, actually for maceration and beetles, the smell tends to stick to your skin and your clothes and in your nose um, for a few days. And it's, it's a bit frustrating to work with, but um, yes. So, so there is some uh, strong smells and um, when working with ammonia, there's also that smell as well. Any other questions? Um, uh, so question about the uh, taxidermied alligator. Um, so that, that is one of our items that ended up in the collection, but we don't actually know where it came from. Um, it looks to be a young animal that um, it's got some damage to it. Um, so it's been there for quite some time. Um, not sure how we got it, uh, but it was made to look very smiley and happy. Um, It also uses some of the uh, older um, taxidermy methods. Um, as a side note, if you're dealing with, if you come across a very old taxidermy, um, don't touch it. It might have been prepared with arsenic um, to prevent any animals eating it, and arsenic is uh, very dangerous, so don't touch it. Um, I think there are a couple other taxonomy pieces. I think there's um, an armadillo. Uh, I think there's an armadillo that was turned into a basket in uh, that's on display right now, I think on the fourth floor. Um, but I think that's about it for taxonomy specimens. Um, uh, again, it's it it doesn't really fall into our collection collection scope as much. Um, and the specimens we do have kind of ended up there, yes, in the pioneer cabin. Um, specimens we do have kind of end up here by chance. Um, or they were connected with uh, an important person in central Florida who donated uh, that along with other items. And it just made more sense to keep it with the collection. Okay, if there's no more questions, um, I'm going to go to the next slide, which again, it has uh, some pictures of some, some of the more interesting specimens I came across in my work. Um, they're also a bit more graphic. So if you don't wanna see that, uh, you, can, you can head out now. Okay. Um, so just going through these, the, the top one is a Langer monkey that uh, was um, frozen for, it, it had been frozen since at least the 80s, possibly the 70s, um, and it was very stiff. Um, below that is a harbor porpoise fetus that was um, that ended up not being born and got expelled onto a dock in San Francisco. Uh, below that is a rhesus macaque, uh, probably a, a newborn rhesus macaque um, that didn't survive. Next to that is a bottlenose dolphin skull um, with the skin removed. And right next to that is the eyes and tongue that were removed from that bottlenose dolphin. Um, above that is a gray whale um, with more of the internal organs exposed. That's mainly the intestines. 
um, and a big crowd of people watching. Um, next to that is a Pacific white-sided dolphin that washed up on shore. And uh, next to the bottlenose dolphin tongue is the face of a California sea lion. Um, and that, that's just the face, no skull. Um, and next to that is a, another rhesus macaque. Um, and it's, you can see it's pointing to its stomach, which uh, all that yellow is actually fat. Um, again, this, this is another specimen that uh, probably died in the 70s or 80s. Um, and it was incredibly, it was an incredibly unhealthy animal. Um, most likely part of a, a, a laboratory study, not a zoo. Um, and that fat was throughout the entire body. Um, and the, the tail for that animal is actually so fatty you could see through, see through the uh, muscle and um, see the veins in it. Let's see, any last questions? Okay, well, thank you everyone for attending and uh, hope you enjoy the rest of your day.